Hi students, welcome back to geology. Today we are talking about fossils and fossilization. Okay, so we're first going to take an intro to fossils here and start looking at how those are made. So a fossil is any remain or trace or imprints of past life. And these must be preserved in some sort of rock or sediment. Most of the time, these are found in sedimentary rocks only because metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks get buried to depths at which the fossil would not survive, right? So with igneous rocks, they fully melt. They come from a magma. So you would never see bones inside what used to be molten lava or magma. And with metamorphic rocks, they are buried and squished and applied a lot of pressure and heat, and that would completely destroy the fossils. So we're only going to be looking at sedimentary rocks when we're talking about fossils. Okay, who studies fossils? That would be a paleontologist. So paleontology is the scientific study of fossilized remains and early life on Earth. That's not to be confused with an archaeologist who studies prehistoric people and their culture. Okay, so <clears throat> there is a difference between a paleontologist and an archaeologist, although a lot of times they do work together on dig sites depending on what is happening at the dig site and what happened in, in the past and that area. So how are fossils made? So there's only a few number of fossils that actually get preserved. So to see a fossil is actually really special because there's very specific conditions that have to happen in order for the fossil to be preserved. So dead organisms have to be buried in soft sediment very quickly and then compressed so that they can be preserved. Most of the time that also includes them needing to have hard parts. So they need to have some sort of skeletal remains that are being compressed in the sediment or they're might not be fossilized. Um, <clears throat> in the event that there are soft parts, like in a fish, if they are buried with soft sediment where little to no oxygen can actually reach the specimen, then we would maybe see a carbonization or all of that carbon material basically get impressed onto the soft sediment. And then it leaves behind a fish fossil like this one here, where you can see the soft parts of the fish. Right, so this is what scientists, paleontologists would be doing every day, uncovering different fossils. And this one in particular shows you how they would brush off the sediment and they have to be very gentle um, because if they are not gentle, then they can destroy the fossil. All right, so fossils include animals and plants, which, you know, we already kind of talked about, but they also include bacteria and fungi. And so bacteria and fungi can also be preserved in the rock record. And we can see that in these two images here. So the bottom right is a um, stromatolite. And these would have been um, fossilized things like cyanobacteria or things that would have been um, in the ocean that might have fall into the ocean floor and got preserved in the sediment. And then fungi can also be preserved, although it's a lot harder to see. So there's a microscopic view of one there in the upper right hand corner. Plants, of course, being the leaf there and then the dinosaur fossil being the animal example. All right, so there are three types of fossils. OK, so we have Fossils are any remains like we've talked about already. So they can be traces or imprints of life that have been preserved over time. And depending on whether they are an actual piece of the animal or they are a trace of the animal, we're gonna call it something a little bit different. Um, so the first one we're gonna talk about are body fossils. So with body fossils, these are the actual preserved body parts of the organism. They can either be altered or they can be unaltered. If they are altered, they've gone through some sort of chemical change or physical change. And in that case, you may or may not have actual body parts or bone remaining. Um, whereas if they are unaltered, you basically have the same bone left over. Okay, so those are body fossils. With trace fossils, we're looking at traces of the animal. So these can be things like tracks or burrows where... <clears throat> the organism was wiggling its way through sediment. 
Um, this can also come in the form of copper lights, which is fossilized poop. And then we have molds and casts, which are impressions of the specimen. And then, of course, we do have pseudofossils, which are technically fake fossils. They are not real. Um, they may look like fossils, but they are not. So here on the left, we have raindrop imprints. And then on the right, we have something called a dendrite, which is actually made by a mineral process. And it's not actually a fossil, although a lot of people think that they are fossils. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is body fossils. And with body fossils, we need to look at the mode of preservation. So how are they preserved? And depending on whether they were altered or unaltered, we're going to see different types of preservation. Okay, so with unaltered body fossils, these can come in the form of just the original skeletal material was dug up. We can see tar impregnation. We can see amber entombment. We can see refrigeration and mummification. So we'll go through each of those individually. Right, with original skeletal material, this is when the hard parts are preserved and you are looking at original samples when you're looking at the fossil. So here are a couple of shells. We have a gastropod in the upper left and then the ammonite in the bottom right. So these are shelled organisms where you have the shell, which is technically a fossil because the animal is not there anymore. Um, but this is original skeletal material here. With tar impregnation, this occurs where we have some sort of tar in the ground and it has actually seeped into the hard parts of the skeleton <clears throat> and preserved those pieces and basically has replaced it with tar. So this is really common in California, especially in Southern California where we have the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. And the little wire tar pits are a huge area where there are these big pits of tar. They're still there technically. <clears throat> and animals would either get stuck, in, most of the time they did get stuck in the tar, and they wouldn't be able to leave. So they would either starve to death or they would be scavenged by larger, crit larger critters, <laughs> larger creatures. Um, so, for example, if a mammoth got stuck in the tar, a saber might come over and just eat him for dinner. All right, amber entombment. This is the very popular um, reason why they could bring dinosaurs back to life in Jurassic Park. Um, they had a mosquito that was preserved in the amber. And because mosquitoes actually suck out blood, it had the blood of a T-Rex or something of the sort in its preservation inside the amber and they just extracted it from the mosquito and then patched it with some frog DNA and made a dinosaur. <laughs> but um, in all reality, this technically does happen. Whether you'd be able to pull out DNA from a mosquito in one is very particular. You'd have to know that that mosquito bit a dinosaur right before it was trapped in the amber. Um, but the way it gets the, the mosquito or any type of insect gets stuck in the amber is <clears throat> the tree sap that leaks out of a lot of trees. If an insect gets stuck in that and it gets preserved over time and buried, it can become amber. And so we can see the full preservation of lots of soft parts and some hard parts in certain cases in the amber. And it's a very good kind of like frozen in time insect. All right, then we also have refrigeration, which is common when we have lots of glaciers, lots of ice sheets. In um, the Ice Age times, so around 40,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago or so, we saw a lot of mammoths that were roaming the earth and they liked to be in colder temperatures because that's what they were evolved to withstand. And um, if they died and were covered with ice quickly, they could be basically frozen in time. <clears throat> so this mammoth here is actually a baby mammoth and it died around 39,000 years ago and it was fully preserved. Its hair, its skin, all of it was fully preserved in the ice. Mummification is similar. 
Um, but this is when the bones and the tissues of the organisms in a desert area are preserved. Often, if you touch them, they are going to completely fall apart, which makes it really difficult when one of these are found and they're trying to put them back together and try to piece them together. They're very fragile. So oftentimes what happens is they are cast so that they get a mold of the specimen and then they can just leave the specimen that they actually found in a lab somewhere and not actually have it on display and they'll have a, a replica on display. And that's the case with a lot of specimens. They will make a cast and mold of the specimen and then they will just put the replica on display and they will keep the actual specimen behind in a lab. That way it stays preserved because you have the general public around some of these specimens. You're not going to have them for very long. All right, now we're looking at altered body fossils. So those were all the unaltered body fossils. Now we're looking at altered. Okay, so this comes when there's a chemical change or physical change to the specimen. And a lot of times some of the specimen material isn't really left over, so it's not really bone that's there anymore, but it's something else. And so this can come in the form of permineralization, replacement, recrystallization, and carbonization. All right, so with permineralization, these are the hard parts are replaced by some sort of material. So oftentimes we need pore spaces in these specimens. So we need something like a pine cone or a bone that has pore spaces in it. And that pore space can fill with water that has dissolved minerals in it. And then that water that those minerals can basically recrystallize <clears throat> filling in those pore spaces and then preserving the pine cone or the bone or whatever it may be. Okay, so with permineralization, we're working with pore spaces where mineral minerals in the water can actually flow through and crystallize within those pore spaces, preserving the sample. With replacement, it's similar because we're still working with water that has dissolved minerals in it, but it completely replaces all of the material. So there's no actual specimen left. It's not just filling in pore spaces. This is where the water that flows through actually replaces all of the hard, our hard parts. So for example, we have this ammonite in the bottom left here. That ammonite is full pyrite. So the ammonite shell isn't there anymore. It's all just pyrite now. And so there's various minerals that can crystallize within these samples that will help preserve the sample for us. Okay, so that was replacement. Now recrystallization is similar, but a little bit different. So with recrystallization, the chemical composition is already there. The makeup of the specimen is already there and it's just being recrystallized. And so with this ammonite, for example, it is made of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is the main component in calcite. And so under certain conditions, buried at depth, the calcite can recrystallize and basically the entire specimen is now calcite and there's not any more of the shell left over. And so with uh, recrystallization, replacement and permineralization, they all deal with crystals kind of replacing material but in a different way, okay? So remember, permineralization fills in pore spaces. Replacement completely replaces the entire material with an outside crystal. And then recrystallization is recrystallizing the existing material. Try to distinguish between them. It can be kind of confusing. So <clears throat> try to focus on those simple definitions and it'll help you kind of tell the difference. All right, and then we have carbonization, which we've already talked about a little bit. <clears throat> But if a soft part organism gets buried very quickly with soft sediment, all of the oxygen can be squeezed out and there will be a carbon imprint on the sediment. Granted, we do need light colored sediment because as you can imagine, if the, we get a darker colored sediment, it's gonna be really hard to see the actual fossil. Um, but here we have a fish, a leaf and a cockroach, all of which have soft parts and they were preserved from the carbon imprint on the sediment once there was sediment squishing the organism after it died. All 
All right, next we're going to look at trace fossils. Okay, so these are traces from the organism and how it lived. So the first one here is a cast and a mold. So a mold is an imprint that the organism leaves. Okay, so you have a shell, it pushes down into sediment and you remove the shell. What it left behind is a mold. So it's like a cupcake mold. Okay, so it's an impression left behind by the specimen. And then the cast would be if that impression was filled in with some sort of other sediment and then removed. And now you have a cast of what the impression of the organism was. Okay, so you can think of the mold as like a cupcake mold and the cupcake that you poured into the cupcake mold is the cast. Okay, so the cast is what comes out of the mold and the mold is what the impression was left behind by the specimen. So here is an example of a gastropod cast and a gastropod mold and then a fossil seed mold and cast. So none of the original material is here. This is all just sediment and impression and then sediment filled in. All right, then we have burrows, which are traces of how an animal like a worm would have moved through soft sediment. So we know that lots of animals burrow. A lot of the burrows that get preserved are on the smaller side because the larger scale burrows that maybe like a groundhog would make are usually pretty large and that's going to be harder to preserve than just a small wormhole. And so um, if you see a tube like feature like this, maybe it's on top of a rock or maybe you have a good specimen like this, this shows you that the organism would have slithered through the sediment in this fashion. Then we have tracks. Tracks can show you how an animal moved. So these are your imprints from their feet or their hooves or whatever they had as they walked through soft sediment. If that sediment was preserved then in a rock, you would see the tracks in the fossil record. This can tell you something about how fast the animal moved, um, what the animal was doing at the time. Maybe it was running from something or maybe it was just on a stroll. Um, so you can tell a lot about the animal's behaviors based on the tracks that are left behind. So when people say, uh, well, the T-Rex moved this fast. That's where that information is coming from, is from dinosaur tracks. All right, and then we have coprolites, which are fossilized poop that everybody think is, thinks is really funny. <laughs> but um, just like with anything, it can be completely replaced by sediment, so you're not necessarily holding poop when you hold it, although it still oftentimes looks like it, which can be gross. Um, but this can tell you something about how the animal's diet was, what it ate, um, and that can be really important when we're trying to put um, the hierarchy in order, like knowing that the T-Rex was a scavenger versus it being a particular hunter, um, knowing that some of these animals were vegetarian or they were herbivores or they were uh, carnivores. So their coprolites tell us a lot about how they lived, what they ate. All right, so really quick, can you identify whether this is a trace fossil or a body fossil? Okay, so I'll give you, pause the video, answer the question, and then um, we will continue. All right, so for A up here at the top, is that a trace fossil or a body fossil? That's a trace fossil, right? That's a track, it's a dinosaur track. All right, B, trace fossil or body fossil? It's a body fossil, it's a tooth, right? C, is that a trace or a body fossil? Those are burrows, so that's a trace fossil. And then D, is that a body or a trace fossil? Well, that's the fossil of a turtle, so it is a body fossil. All right, now we need to look at preservation. So can you name the preservation? So pause the video, answer the questions, and see if you can figure it out. All right, so A, is that a... Um, Let's see, permineralization, replacement, carbonization, recrystallization. That is petrified wood, and petrified wood is oftentimes preserved by permineralization. So A would be permineralization. B is almost the exact picture I showed you earlier, which would be recrystallization. C is going to be your amber entombment. And then D, if you weren't sure, 
is actually tar impregnation. The way that you know that it's tar is because of the color of the fossil. So that kind of deep, dark color to the skull, kind of like a really dark brown color, that is the color of the tar preserves the specimen in. And so when you see that, you know that it's automatically tar impregnation. All right, and then the last thing here is we're going to go through some of California's state fossils. So trilobite is the first one. Then we'll go through the giant short-faced bear, the spilodon, the mammoth, the plesiosaur, the mosasaur, and hadrosaur. And these are not all of the fossils ever found in California, but these are some of the big hitters. All right, so trilobites are really important because they are a good index fossil. Good index fossil is something that lived during a very specific time frame but they were widespread throughout the globe. So the trilobite lived between 540 and 520 million years. So from the Cambrian to the Permian. And while 20 million years sounds like a long time, that's a very specific time frame within Earth's history. Remember, Earth is old, 4.6 billion years old. So 20 million years is chump change, right? So it's a very specific time frame. So this is important when you're looking at sediment that might have a trilobite in it. If you have a rock that has a trilobite in it, you automatically know that there's a 20 million year time frame that your sediment would have formed. And so it's a good index fossil for dating the actual rock. And so the trilobite is named by its three lobes. So that's what's the very distinctive feature. And the horseshoe crab is the living relative at this time. The giant short-faced bear is larger than any living bear on earth right now. Um, they lived from about 1.8 million years until around 11,000 years ago when we had a pretty large extinction event at the end of the Ice Age. On all fours, they stand at five and a half to six feet tall. I cannot imagine actually standing next to one of these bears. Um, and they are called the giant short-faced bear because not only are they giant, but they also have a very short nozzle. And so that makes them a little bit more distinct from the bears that we see today, like the black bear and the grizzly bear. The Smilodon is the California state fossil. He lived around 500 million years ago to 11,000 years ago as well. And it's actually a little smaller than I think most people think they are. They're around 41 inches in height. I think it kind of gets a bad rap. People think that they're much larger than they are. Um, but it is the most muscular feline species we've ever seen with the largest canines. It could take up to three years for their canines to fully grow to 7 to 12 inches long, which is a very long canine. And that meant that baby sabers actually stayed with their parents for a lot longer while their canines came in. And so it kind of shows that they were a little bit more pack-like than a lot of people originally imagined. But the canines would have been for the initial blow, so they would have put it into the jugular of their victim and hopefully severed a major artery. And then they would use the back teeth for grinding and chewing everything else. All right, then we have the mammoth, which also lived around the same time as the saber tooth or in the Pleistocene. They were five meters in height. So they're larger than any elephant on earth today. A lot of them have been found in the La Brea tar pits and in the Fairmead landfill, which is in Madeira. Um, there is a fossil discovery center in Madera County that you can visit that there are some mammoth parts on display and just seeing how vast they are. This image is actually from the La Brea Tar Pits Museum um, and there's a couple of different displays there as well if you're interested. But they have the real iconic large tusks that come around and they were help, helpful for protection. And then they also had a very thick coat fur um, that was helpful for the environment they were in during the Ice Age. Then we have a plesiosaur, which lived 203 million years ago. So we're going a little bit further back in time here. Um, they are known as the sea monster. They look like Nessie, the Loch Ness monster. Um, but the interesting thing about their long neck is that it was actually fairly rigid. It had a full vertebrae down its neck, which meant that it wasn't like a flimsy jello-like feature. It was a very stiff, kind of like a giraffe um, neck. And these guys reached up to 49 feet 
long. So very long. Um, there is a skull of the plesiosaur at Fresno State in their science building on display, as well as a really nice mural of what Fresno County would have looked like in um, these times, 203 million years ago or so. And then, of course, they died with the dinosaurs at 65 million years ago. So we have a mosasaur, which lived around the same time, a little bit <clears throat> closer to um, the extinction event. And that was 145 million years ago to 61 to 65-ish million years ago when most dinosaurs disappeared. They were also very long, but they were a little bit more like a crocodile or an alligator, um, 33 to 59 feet long. There was a lot of variation in the mosasaur's size. So there were some that were very small and then some that were much larger. The much larger ones would eat plesiosaurs, dolphins, and even smaller mosasaurs. Um, so if you were a smaller mosasaur, you're still not necessarily the apex predator. You might still actually get eaten by a larger mosasaur. Um, but they were up to 30,000 pounds. And then, like I said, they also disappeared with the disappearance of the dinosaurs. And then hadrosaurs, we did have a few of those in California. They lived 85 million years ago until the extinction of the dinosaurs. They were about 10 feet in height, and they weighed around 15,000 to 18,000 pounds, so pretty heavy. Um, and these ones were actually interesting because they were pretty maternal. So a lot of them were found kind of preserved next to eggs. So they, based on some of the trace evidence of the hadrosaur, a lot of scientists believe that they are very maternal in nature and a lot more trying to protect their young until they were ready to protect themselves, obviously, from things like the T-Rex that, you know, was a scavenger and looking for things to eat like the hadrosaur. Um, and the hadrosaur was an herbivore. So they ate plants and things. They didn't eat other dinosaurs. <laughs> so, All right. So what we learned in this lecture was body fossils and trace fossils. Remember, body fossils are the actual preserved remains of the skeletal material. So this is either altered or unaltered. And then the trace fossils are traces of the organisms. And they can either show us how they lived or what they ate things like that. And then we do see a pretty wide variety of different types of fossils in California. All right. I will see you guys in the next lecture. Bye.